Well, here we are again, folks. Uh, of late, I'm back in uh, my original studies when I was in school, uh, studying in Wilmington's Guide to the Bible. One of the best study books you'll ever find. It uses the King James Version Bible, and it's a study book put together for those who are stewardess in the Bible and want to learn what the Bible really says and dig into the scripture and learn Bible words. Learn how to read the Bible. Uh, it might be difficult for you to start in Genesis, but I would recommend reading at least the first chapter or two. And then if you want to skip the genealogies and whatever, go over and start in the New Testament in Matthew and read the New Testament. I really believe that the key to the New Testament is the Old Testament. Because many things I referred to in the New Testament that came out of the Old Testament. What is the Old Testament? It is the testator of the New Testament. Uh, the Old Testament is the testator of the New Testament, and the New Testament is the testator of the Old Testament. They work back and forth with each other. They testify of what happened back there to the New Testament, and the New Testament testifies what's happening here. We can go back and find a happening in the Old Testament or where God prophesied it to happen. So that's important. Now, in, in reading Joel, I've read Joel today, and as I read Joel again today, so I don't know how many times, but I've read it, and, and I've kind of done a little brushing up on it. And I want to tell you what it, it sums up. Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon, uh, Charles H. Spurgeon wrote a piece on Joel that he put in. He, he wrote this. I want to read it. The, the book of Joel tells about the locusts, which is God's army. This, God, God controls the locusts. That's his army. He can take the locusts and destroy the earth with it if he wants to. Uh, their teeth are like iron. And their jaw teeth are like lion's teeth that can crush up bone. And they can eat up, they can land, come in a swarm, and it will, the sky will darken perfectly black. The stars won't shine, you won't see the moon, you won't see the sun. When they fly in by the billions. Now before, if you want to study the locusts, go back and study... Uh, in historical swarms of locusts. God has blown them with a great wind before across the sea, across an ocean, and let them blow in that wind and get across there and then ravage the land. When they land, they eat everything. Everything. They, they eat the bark off the trees, leave the tree standing there, solid white, with nothing on it, not a spur, nowhere. They've ate every little piece that's sticking out on the limbs. They've skinned the bark all the way off it, and there's nothing left but a, a white hull standing there. When the locusts come in, they devour everything, and then they leave behind a worm called a canker worm, and this worm gets in the, there. And then there's another worm that comes from that worm. And they make sure that after they eat the top of the ground, that worm goes in and eats part of the roots, the, the soft part of the roots or whatever. And then there's another worm that goes down and gets the whole thing so that it'll never grow again. Kills it dead. Turns the land back into desert. And that's how that works when that locust comes by. And God uses that and calls it his army. He calls it his army. That's one of his armies. 
<laughs> we think about human armies battling with tanks and guns and all that kind of stuff. Okay, I got news for you. You deplete the food supply and you got a better army than any bullet shooting army there ever was. Uh, all the tanks in the world can't do what locusts can do. All the armies in the world can't do what locusts will do. They'll have the ability. Locusts have the ability to strip the ability of the land to produce food. With no food, men starve to death. A very short time and cannibalism shows up. A very short time and cannibalism shows up. People begin to starve to death. And they start cooking. Uh, nowadays, right here, they'd probably cook cats and dogs first, but that wouldn't take long. Then they'd have to start cooking people. It's happened before a couple times in the Bible. And it can happen again. And it is, by the way, in some countries still done. Where they still do uh, single out and eat others. And so... Here we are, though, look, yes, those wasted years over which we sigh shall be restored to us. God can give us such plentiful grace that we shall crowd into the remainder of our days as much of service as will be some recompense for those years of unregeneracy over which we mourn and humble penance. I do say that I spent 30 years of my life in wickedness. And I do have repentance for that. I would say right now that studying this study here in Joel today, restudying this statement from C.H. Spurgeon as he did the book of Joel, I find myself weighed in the balance and I find I, that I'm wanting, that I'm not performing all that I should, that I'm not performing like I should, that I'm not giving enough repentance to my wife. Like the locust, a backsliding wilderness, lukewarmness, are now viewed by us as a terrible plague. Lukewarmness is like the plague of locusts coming and eating everything. Jesus said, I will spew the lukewarm out of my mouth when I come. I want you to be hot or cold. And if you're hot, I'm going to take you. And if you're cold, I'm going to pass by you. Oh, that they had never come near us. The Lord in mercy has now taken them away. And we are full of zeal to serve him. Now, what Mr. Spurgeon's saying, like the locusts in Joel, is a picture of the world in a man's life. Alcohol on a daily basis, illicit love, illicit sex, illicit stealing, lying, cheating, everything that you do. All opposite from God, you go all the way to the root Many, 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 many millions of people today have ended up and still are and in prison and headed to prison because they're living in that bliss of, uh, as the locusts do, in wickedness. Blessed is his name. We can rise, raise such harvest of spiritual graces as shall make our former bitterness and despair through rich grace we can turn to account. 
I will get an experience. I don't know about you, but I lived at number one Suicide Street one time with the pistol cocked and loaded. And this was after I met the Lord. And the Lord said, that's not the answer. I'm the answer. Wait on me, call on me. I will deliver you. We need to use our past experience to warn others that we can become the more rooted in humanity, in a childlike dependence and patient spirituality by reason of our former shortcomings. If we are the more watchful, the more zealous, the more tender, we shall gain by our lamentable losses the wasted years by a miracle of love can be stored, be restored. Does it seem too great a bone to carry? Let us believe for it. Let us live for it. And we may yet realize it even as Peter became all the more useful, a man after his presumptuous was cured by his discovered weakness and used by the Lord's grace and made into being a great witness for God and a great man of God. We're all, we all have Peter in us. We all have that Peter thing in us that we uh, uh, could boast there's nothing I can't do I'm, I'm here I'm, man I'm the guy who can do it but God had to show Peter that he couldn't do it in his flesh he had to do it by the spirit and God delivered Peter with a great miracle and it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered Listen to this. Why do I not call on his name? I find myself asking that question. I find myself asking that question. Where is my faith? Why do I run to this neighbor or that neighbor when God is so near and will hear my faintest call? All I have to do is ask. He said he knows every sparrow that falls on the ground. How much more does he care for us? Why do I sit down and devise schemes and invent plans? Why not at once roll myself and my burden upon the Lord? Why don't I straight forward? It is best, a runner. Why do I not run at once to the living God? And forget everything else. In vain shall I look for deliverance anywhere else. But with God I shall find it. For here I have his royal. Shell to make it show. When God says shall, he means I will. I need not ask whether I may call on him or not, for the word whosoever is a very wide and comprehensive one. Whosoever means me. Whosoever means you.
For it means anybody and everybody who will call upon God. I will therefore follow the leading of this text, the book of Job. And at once call upon the glorious Lord who has made so large a promise. He is showing total destruction in the book of Joel. This is where man is. He is totally wiped out. The locus of sin has stripped him down to where he's absolutely, positive, 100% useless. And God comes along and says, I'll tell you what I'll do. I'll put some new bark back on your tree. I'll put some new life in your limbs. I'll produce leaves on your tree. I will produce fruit on your tree. If you but just abide in me, come to me and ask me, I will do what you need done. I will take care of you. And at once call upon the glorious Lord who has made so large a promise. I find myself sitting here doing PH tidbits, which the Lord put on my heart to do and showed me how to do it and study the Bible and put it on here, and I find myself wanting, spiritually. I find myself spiritually declined. When did I, the last soul that I won? When was that? It's been a while, one-on-one -on -one personally. I've had the opportunity in groups to win groups of people, but that's different. But one-on-one -on -one is another story. That's where your neighbors come in and the people in your town. He, he, uh, C.H. Spurgeon said, my case is urgent. I would take that word my out and put our case is urgent. And I do not see how I am to be delivered. But this is no business of mine. He who made the promise will find out ways and means of keeping it. It is mine to obey his command. It is not mine to direct his causes. I am his servant, not his selector. I call on him and he will deliver me. This is a man that lived in the early 1800s. This is a man that wrote thousands of messages. I have them in books. This is a man that right here, after reading Joel, he weighed his life and probably one of the most spiritual men that ever, ever, ever since the, the last day that, uh, the last pages of the Bible was written, this is probably one of the closest men to God that ever walked. I read in here, as I'm reading what he's writing, I read that he is in a strait. He is in a place where the locusts have torn him down. He is in a place where he was in a town, perhaps, and he came to do a great work, and they ran him out. They said, we don't want you here. We don't want your kind here. We don't want the people that really believe in God here. We want people that are little old money collectors that with everything's a smile and a, everything's good, and you send me a $10, and God will give you 50 And a bunch of lying, cheating people 
under the name of the Lord, and they, they are. They're lying and cheating. And using the name of the Lord to do it. Multitudes. 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 In the Valley of Decision. Every way you look, go to Walmart. Multitudes in Walmart trying to make a decision. What am I going to buy? I came down here. I didn't really want anything in particular, but I'm going to look at everything, see what I'm going to buy. Take that money, put it in the free will offering as a church. You don't need another thing in your house, nothing. If you're at Walmart shopping for something you don't know what you're shopping for, you don't need what you're shopping for. If you put your 10% in the collection plate, like you're supposed to, of what you made, and you're down, and by the way, if you're down there spending your 10% on something you don't know what you want, God will let you spend it all, and then he'll let it catch on fire and burn the whole thing up. Or a robber will come in and rob everything that looks like it's worth anything. 99% of the stuff from Walmart ain't worth a dime. I got windshield wipers on my car. They don't, they don't clean the windshield. I bought them at Walmart. They're worthless. And many other things you buy are worthless. They just don't work. And, just, and if they do work, they don't last. It's, it's, all, it's all a big front. And, you, and the American people are buying into it. The Valley of Decision. For the day of the Lord is near, and the valley of decision is here. We've got to make that decision. Are we going to follow God or not? Are we going to follow the doctrines in the Bible of the inspiration of God? Who, who has taken us from a hellish life of uh, desperation and gave in us a personal election and by this Bible, this book a foreknowledge of what is to come and a foreknowledge of the glories that are going to be in heaven, the the position you're going to have in heaven for what you do on the earth if you if you are a soul winner if you have the attributes of God and you are a soul winner you will have a position in heaven of, of that soul winner another one of Spurgeon's little writings here Come and let us return unto the Lord, for he hath torn, and he will heal us. He hath smitten, and he will bind us up. Has God had to tear you lately? He's had to tear me a little bit. Has he had to smite you a little bit lately? He's had to smite me a little bit lately. Has he had to bind you up now? He's binding me up now. He's binding me up through the study that I'm doing right now. He's saying, I'm showing you where your error is. If you're in, you're in all the way. And if you're not in all the way, you're not in. You've got to be in all the way to be in his army. It is the Lord's way to tear before he heals. This is the honest love of his heart and the sure surgery of his hand. <laughs> hey, if your appendix goes bad, you got to go to the hospital and get your little old appendix took out. The Lord has blessed me. I'm 76 and I'm healthy right now. As far as I know, as healthy as a good ringing bell. And 
I still have my tonsils. I still have my appendix. I still have those little things God gave you to keep your body functioning properly. I feel like that many of our problems today, health-wise in people, is that when they had their tonsils out, those tonsils were there for a reason. Personally, I'm not a doctor, I don't know what reason it was. But I feel like it had a reason and I still got mine. And I have my appendix for a reason and I still got it. And I, I think that God made us like we're made on purpose. And he put every little thing in us that he put in us on purpose. And the more you have taken out, the more chance you have, I believe, of having something else come on you that's worse. But there are some things God wants to take out of us. So the sure surgery of his hand, he also bruises before he binds up. Or else it would be an unclean, uncertain work. The law comes before the gospel. The sense of need before the supply of it. The render now under the convicting, crushing hand of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the loving hand of the Holy Spirit sometimes has to crush. If you want the juice out of an orange, which is the part that you can drink and it's good for your health, you have to crush the orange. Has he received the spirit of bondage again to fear? No. He does not give that. This is a solitary preliminary to real, real to the real gospel healing and binding up. Do not despair, dear heart but come to the Lord with all thy jagged wounds, black bruises, running sores. He alone can heal. He delights to do it. It is our Lord's office to bind up the brokenhearted, and he is glorious at home at it. Let us not linger. But at once return unto the Lord, from whom we have gone astray. Let us show him our gaping wounds and beseech him to know his work, his own work, and complete it. If we started out his work, we still are his work. If we have dabbled in something, that God would not have us dabble in. Ask him to forgive us. Let him bind those wounds and come to him and go to work and complete it. Will a surgeon make an incision and then leave his patient to bleed to death? Why, absolutely not. Will the Lord pull down our old houses and then refuse to build us a better one? Absolutely not. Dost thou ever wantonly increase the misery of poor, anxious souls? Absolutely not. That be far from thee, O Lord. No. You sin, and the Lord's not going to pound on your grief if you come to Him and say, God, I have sinned. Forgive me. Immediately, God forgives you. I study a whole lot about the sea of forgetfulness. There's a crystal sea before the throne of God that God himself can't look into because the glare off the top of it is so shiny. The holiness of God over the top of this sea. What's under there? This is what I believe. He said he cast the sins that we had into the sea of forgetfulness. 
I believe the sea of forgetfulness is before the throne of God. And when he opens the books, and my name is Peter, and it says, Peter sinned such and such a sin on such and such a date. It's going to be a blank page. Because Peter confessed that sin and said, God, forgive me. And God cast it into the sea of forgetfulness. I'll probably have as many pages as there is in this Bible of the sins that got cast in the sea of forgetfulness and all them pages will be blank. Not one of those sins will be against me. Not one. They'll be gone. Sometimes it's penalty for a sin that we have to suffer on this earth. And sometimes it's penalty that we may have to suffer in heavenly places by a loss of reward because of something we did. But the sin itself will be gone, erased, be put into the sea of forgetfulness. That's the God we serve. Well, this has been Brother Peter, kind of having a little conversation today as I study and muse on the word and I call on the Lord and I ask forgiveness for my shortcomings and I see that uh, the time is at hand and our time is short on this earth and we must get going so that we carry all of the souls that we can to heaven with us. And so we must be out here sowing seed of godly seed that would bring souls to the Lord. We'll see you next time. Bye-bye.